My name is Jim Enox. I'm here today on a mission representing the old Ramsey gang, which were my companions on the James River in my early days and my later days, as a matter of fact. Uh, I'm one of the three remaining surviving members, and I feel like I'm telling their story as much as mine. And I'm sure there's a few souls hanging around up there observing me now, being real sure that I do this thing right. So here we go. I guess my earliest firm recollection of the James River is when I was eight years old. And my Uncle Lewis taught me how to row in an old slab-sided rowboat that my father found somewhere and had gotten for me and made out of three-quarter inch boards. And of course, the bottom boards ran uh, perpendicular to the stern and the bow of the boat. And uh, it was very heavy and had to be kept in the water because otherwise it would dry out and start leaking. <clears throat> so he taught me how to, to row. And uh, he went out with me a few times. And pretty much after that, I was on my own. And I spent a lot of time on the river on my own alone and still do, as it happens. Uh, but uh, I ran with a group called the Ramsey Gang. It was all a group of us that lived on Ramsey Avenue in Hopewell, which runs along the river, uh, runs up behind the uh, commercial docks and uh, down behind what we then called the fishing boat dock, which I'll describe a little later. Uh, and uh, of course, I, the river was there. You accepted it. You didn't realize how valuable and important it was. You were just enjoying it and the atmosphere of it. And the, the feel of being out on it was always uh, a thrill, some large, some small, depending on the weather, sometimes in the more, in the more violent weather, it got pretty, pretty large. Uh, but um, I remember very early on uh, that I learned how to row when I was doing pretty well, and I got myself a, a uh, clothes hanger pole out of closet, closet rods, what they call them, and used it as a mast and found an old awning and cut it down as a sail, and I would row up against the wind, whichever direction it was coming from, for a quarter of a mile or so, and set my sail and sail back down. That was a great sport for me in those days. Uh, we, um, I'm trying to think of the chronology here, but as time went on, I mean, the next couple of years, when I got to be 10 or 11, we, all of our bunch spent a lot of time on the river, and everybody had some kind of an old rowboat. There were only two boats on the river that we knew of that had engines in them. One was the mail boat. And the mail boat uh, was birthed in Hopewell, but it was there to serve all the plantations on the Charles City side of the river. Because the roads were so bad, it was a lot easier to deliver mail by water than it was to drive it around. And the, uh, the old boy, I, and I'm not going to name any names because some of these stories, uh, the, um, the family members still around might take under water. I don't think they would, but nevertheless, best I just leave the names off. But the old captain that ran the mail boat had a great gig in that uh, in the summertime, there were always three or four high school girls in their bathing suits up on the, on the deck. That was his decoration, and we... We, uh, we got a big kick out of that since we'd be hanging around the docks at the City Point dock and when he took off in the mornings. And they'd make their rounds and come back late in the afternoon. All the girls would be badly sunburned and go home and treat themselves, I guess. Uh, but uh, the rest of us were in, in rowboats or sailboats, and there were very few sailboats, really, uh, amongst the, the group of Teenagers, not, we weren't teenagers. The, the, the gang at that time, they were traveling the river, mostly rowboats. And uh, the river was just a source of great adventure. We rode 
all up and down this area, explored all the creeks. We hunted for uh, trees that had overhanging limbs that had grapevines running out to them. We'd cut the base off the grapevine and we'd use them for swings. We could swing out into the water, drop in, you know, at some point 20 or 30 feet out, and that was considered to be a great sport at that time, and it was, as a matter of fact. And uh, we found all sorts of things around to adjust ourselves to, uh, something different every day just about. Uh, during the summertime, after we were all 10, to 10 years old and older, uh, I was one of the younger members of the group. Most of them were two years older than I were, some of them three or four. But uh, by the time I was 10, we were, we were on the river almost every day. Uh, we all had chores that we had to take care of before we were allowed to go, and about the only one that uh, my parents required of me was cutting the grass. And as long as I kept the grass cut, I was free to go. And at that time, you could travel anywhere you wanted to. They didn't have to worry about you getting in trouble. Uh, you might get in some trouble, but it was all a mild form. Um, occasionally, you bump into somebody you'd get into a scrap with, but that was pretty rare, and nobody had weapons. <laughs> so uh, they didn't worry about you, and they knew that we could all swim well, because we did. We stayed in the water all the time. Uh, we did have to, uh, in the springtime every other year, we had to get a typhoid shot, because the river was pretty contaminated. There was a lot of raw sewage going in. I'm not sure we had any sewage to pull plants at all, but I know that Richmond had a very inadequate situation, and they sent a lot of raw sewage down our way, and then we had our own. So there were various diseases to, uh, to be acquired if you weren't careful in the river, and we weren't careful, so they insisted that we get the typhoid shots, which were pretty uncomfortable. They made your arms swell up for about two weeks, and it was very sore. But then you were good for a couple of years, and uh, we could do our own thing. My uncle contracted, uh, I've forgotten what, what kind of fever he got from the river, but it affected his heart, weakened his heart, and he died young, about 42 years old as a result of uh, what was in the river in those days. But it didn't slow us down any. We swam every day and played various games and did a lot of things that, uh, that swimming had to offer. There was an island off of the, still is there, off of the City Point dock there off of City Point. I don't know that it has a name. We just called it the island. And we spent a lot of time over there. We'd go over there and spend a day playing various games, hiding, hiding from each other and that kind of stuff, and uh, swimming, lounging around, whatever. I remember one time we were playing one of the hiding games, and the guy that was it and had to hide himself hid himself well enough at uh, about a half hour. We couldn't find him. An hour passed, we couldn't find him. We got worried about him. There was an old sunken barge right in front of the island there, and there was a, one corner of it that peaked up above the row, uh, particularly at low tide. And he had discovered that by diving down through the cargo hole and swimming up to that corner, there was some air up there, and he could stay there as long as he liked. And that's what he was doing that day. He'd never, he had not told us before that. And so that you know, turned out to be a big hideout after a while. Uh, so we, we did that kind of thing, and then such stuff as uh, when they brought the barges, and I know you've seen the hooks that are sitting down there as you're going up the river on the right-hand side just beyond the, uh, the Jordan Point Bridge. There's some old hooks of ships that were actually long, large barges. Uh, that were brought up there by a businessman in town and salvaged by a salvage man operation that he, he uh, backed financially. And they would bring these boats up various places 
and burn them to the waterline, and that's what happened to those, and then salvage all the metal off of them. Uh, we, of course, uh, did our own exploration of them whenever one of those would hit, uh, appear somewhere. So we went all through those things and picked up a few souvenirs and that kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, then there were opportunities. We found out that, well, Southern Materials Corporation uh, was running barges up and down the river almost every day, hauling sand and gravel from the pits up at, uh, at uh, Curl's Neck. And they also had a concrete operation there at the City Point Dock. I'm going to give you that picture in a few minutes. But uh, we discovered that in, in those days, they towed barges. They didn't push them like they do now. And of course, the tugs were much less powerful, smaller horsepower. Typically, a tug would tow about five barges uh, with a length of inch and a half, two inch rope, very heavy rope. And they had to keep moving because if they slowed down the barges, the current would take them out of the channel and they'd get up on the flats. So if we were going somewhere and we had to make a trip, like to come down to what is now the Rice Center was then Camp Richmond, because there was some really good fishing down behind there. I'll tell you about that later on. Uh, we would row. We found out we could row hard. We could catch up with the barge, and we'd tie off to the end of the barges and get up on them, and we could travel down the river wherever we wanted to go, depending on how we were equipped and whether we had enough food and where we were heading, that sort of thing. Uh, they didn't like that, and some of the one, I think one of the old captains finally took a shot with a shotgun at us, but we were down behind the bulkhead that had, held all the sand and gravel. So, you know, perfectly safe operation. So that was part of what, what we did and how we traveled. And we, uh, we made some pretty long trips. We actually went down as far as uh, New Penews one time, which is about 70 miles, on the back of a barge and dropped off and rode in the shore. Excuse me just a minute. Uh, down a nice stretch of beach, <clears throat> sandy beach, and put ashore there. We had a tent with us and some supplies, and we went up to the home that was right above there. We had a nice home up there, and we knocked on the door and said, uh, Mr., you know, we, we are just camping along the river, and we'd sure like to, if you don't mind, camp on your beach for a couple of days. And here's an interesting contrast between then and now. And the gentleman said, I'll tell you what, I'll go you one bed. I just cleaned out my garage. Why don't y'all move in there for a couple of days? You can bring your cots up there. So we did. We stayed in his garage for two days and roamed around Newport News, which was a great adventure for us. Uh, what I didn't mention early on and should have as a background, what Hopewell, after World War I, of course, dropped off from 40,000 people, which manned, most of them manned the plants and so forth, to about 5,000. Very quiet little town, still had some uh, industry going, although the major industry had closed up during the Depression, primarily because there was a strike against it, and they had told the workers that they just were not able to raise wages anymore than they were, although the top people and operators at Allied Chemical and over there at uh, 2B Silk, which was the one that closed, were making $20 a week. And the scale went down from there. But everybody was happy to have those jobs because a lot of people didn't have the jobs and they were working for the WPA and the CCC, which I'm sure you're aware of, that were the government programs back in, in, the, in the, during the Depression. Uh, Nobody got uh, welfare or food stamps, but they got jobs if they wanted them and glad to have them. And those people, the WPA did a lot of good things. They built the grammar school that I eventually went to. Um, the CCC went up into the mountains and developed 
the Appalachian Trail and the bridges and improved all that up there to a great extent. And there were a lot of tales. I, I knew many of the guys that were involved. They are much older than I, but they told their stories. And it was a great adventure for them. It, uh, it turned what was kind of a, might have been a miserable time into a kind of an adventure for them. But anyhow, um, getting back to the, to the story, uh, Hope was a very small town, very insular. We were a very naive bunch. We didn't travel much. A trip to Richmond was a great treat. We'd go, I know my father would take us over occasionally and we'd have dinner. But this was the depression. And nobody had any money, which turned out to be a great thing. I'll tell you about that later. As far as the children was concerned, very onerous for the grown-ups, of course. I remember my father just working like a dog all during the Depression to hold his business together, which he did, and eventually paid all of his Depression debts. And I'll have to tell you that little story, too, unless you stop me on some of this, because I know I'm getting pretty far afield, but I'm coming back to the river. So um, our big focus, really, for fun was either sports in season or the river. And all summer long, it was the river. And we spent all the time we could find available down there. Um, so we traveled the river. We camped. We almost every year would go down to uh, Burles Bay and spend a week down there. And uh, we occasionally have a visitation from somebody in the family who would bring us some extra food and stuff. But it was primarily we were on our own. And we'd fish and we'd loaf around. And uh, there was a wharf down there at Burles Bay in those days called Poole's Wharf. It was owned by Mr. Poole, who was the undertaker in Poolesville, Virginia. And if you travel down Route 10, you go through it real quickly, but you will pass through Poolesville. So he was running the wharf. It was very active in those days and a uh, great source of entertainment. He had a couple of pool tables in there. And I remember his daughter, who was about 10 years old, and they had to build a box for her to get up high enough to be able to handle a pool cue. But she was great. She could run a rack as good as some of the best of them, and she did shame some of the better ones. And she was there, and they always had a jukebox going, playing the ink spots and some of the early entertainers. And we'd hang out around there and swim off the docks and go out and go fish and play around. Seems like a very uh, regular routine, but it wasn't. Something turned up every day, you know, that you had to go out and check out and explore. <laughs> I remember one of the guys father was a very intense fisherman. And he liked, I mean, if he went fishing, he wanted to fish from the time he got out there until dark or close to it. So we went out with him one day. He came down. We took him out in the boat we had down there, which was a Cape Cod dory that we borrowed from a friend of ours that owned it and, and a good roomy boat for us to camp in. And um, so we took him out fishing. And after a couple of hours, we got bored. We caught a lot of croaker and stuff. There was plenty of fish in the river in those days. You could go to Burles Bay and go out to the edge of the channel and catch a bushel basket full of croaker. And I mean nice sized ones like this that you don't see anymore much. Pretty rare and in a very short time. So a couple of hours of it, we'd had, a, had enough. So we got to swimming, which kind of aggravated him a bit. But uh, we, we were, and we decided we'd go and have some fun. So we'd go and jerk on his line, you know. And he, He'd go through the motions and find nothing. We did that for a while, and then he discovered us, and then we got dressed down pretty heavily. Anyway, we wound up spending most of the day out. Finally, talked him into going to shore, and gosh, we must have had, I don't know, three bushel baskets full of croak and spot, which he took home and was very proud of. Uh, so we did that kind of stuff. And um, so I'm back up at this point because I want to give you the scene at the City Point Dock, which was one of the great places we spent our time. We used to hang out on the dock, because the dock had activity. Well, 
The City Point Dock in those days was flanked by the Appomattox Manor, which everybody knows up on the point. And uh, the other end was a dock we called the Fishing Boat Dock, and then on down beyond that was Allied Chemical Docks. Uh, and in between there, on the main dock, uh, there was a big warehouse built by the Buxton Lines people. And they were a freight hauling on the river company that uh, had a couple of big barges that had warehouses built on them. And they hauled freight up to Hopewell and Petersburg and occasionally to Richmond uh, about every other day. And they would come into the dock about the middle of the day from Norfolk being towed barge towed by a tugboat, of course, and unload there. And, and uh, so that was one form of activity. And of course, we were curious about what they were bringing in some days. And then um, the only cat fisherman of the time had a little uh, offshoot of the dock there where he kept uh, his boat, about a 20 foot long wooden boat uh, with an engine in it. That was the other engine on the river. And that engine, and maybe you folks have heard of this or haven't, but it was a Lathrop Marine engine. That was an engine that had one big cylinder. And the cylinder might be this big around and maybe that tall. And in front of it, it would have a flywheel. And it was known as a make or break engine. And just what all that terminology related to the mechanics of the engine I haven't, never knew because the mechanics were always a mystery to me, although I ran some of them in my time. And they put flywheel in front, you had to swing it over and get it rolling, and then the engine would catch up and it would fire. And it fired on every third revolution so that the engine made a very charming noise. It would go boom. The two ch chicks when the exhaust was being blown out by the two revolutions and it didn't fire. And then it would fire again. Well, every boat, fishing boat, crabbing boat on Chesapeake Bay in those days had a Lathrop Marine engine in it. And one of the grand sounds of the bay was in the evening when all those boats would be coming in and you'd hear that boom, ch come in from all over the bay, you know. And I remember the sound so well. It's fascinating. Well, uh, this fisherman, unnamed now, he's, matter of fact, some of his ancestors are still around and one I'm still fishing, but uh, he uh, had his boat there and uh, he'd go out and fish his traps every day and he'd come in about two o'clock in the afternoon and there would be several, well, maybe half a dozen, fellas sitting there on the dock waiting for him to come in that skinned his catfish. And as I recall, he paid them two cents a catfish. And so for they skinned 100 catfish, they'd get $2, which is pretty good money in those days. And you know they skinned a whole lot more than that when you had a good catch. But that's the way he operated. As uh, far as I know, and it was reported, uh, that he wore his hip boots year-round everywhere he went. You see him downtown, he'd have his hip boots on. Well, he was another one of the characters. And uh, then a, <clears throat> a third one, and probably, well, uh, yeah, he, he probably won the prize. The most comfortable, I mean, the most colorful was, uh, was a fellow who ran a tugboat. And um, during the war, war, World War II, he actually bought more tugboats and he had a fleet of them, about five. And he, he uh, did very well with them, got to be a, a multimillionaire, as a matter of fact. And his wife ran one of the boats. And she was the original tugboat Annie. And she had as colorful language as he did and all the rest of the tugboat captains. I don't know whether I ought to tell this one or not. But anyhow, we're down there one day. You can strike it later. We're down there one day hanging around the dock, and here comes the captain in his tugboat and his wife right behind him in her tugboat. <clears throat> they both tied at the dock. 
It's about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And he got down off the boat. He tied up ahead of her and was walking off up the road. She tied up and she yelled at him, where are you going? He said, I'm going up to the big field. I'll be back about 6.30. He said, have dinner ready for me. It was a big field. It was a house of prostitution in Hopel. And so you can imagine. And he turned around and walked on off. <laughs> she turned loose with a, with a volley of the most colorful language, stuff I'd never heard before and I don't think I've heard since, that I think is still hanging in the air down there over City Point Dock. But it was kind of funny, and there was, that kind of thing went on down there. Uh, and then the, the two other guys that, need, that were notable, um, one was a guy who did the salvage work for the businessman that bought the boats and other things that they got into. Um, and he was down there on the water almost every day during the summertime. And his uniform was a um, pair of, uh, of woven cotton undershorts. And that's all he wore all summer. He was, of course, blackened from the sun, and those shorts got washed about once a week, I think. But nevertheless, that and he was quite a character, and so he hung around down there. And then the, other, the last one that I, strikes me in my memory it was a fellow who ran the fishing boat dock. He, he was custodian. He was an ex, uh, and oh, the fishing boat dock was built and was occupied by Manhattan boats that came up in the wintertime and were repaired. There were about a dozen of them, and one of the Manhattan companies used that as such. And usually there were a couple of them there in the summertime being repaired, too, that would come in from the bay for one reason or another. And this old captain, who was a Norwegian uh, fellow who was retired from that fleet, uh, looked after the dock and, and saw to it that nobody came out that it wasn't supposed to. Well, we made friends with the old captain, and we did a lot of, helped him on a lot of things. And I remember one time he dropped his favorite hammer overboard. And the... the uh, uh, channel was about 25 feet deep at that point, and one of more, our more adventurous and older guys um, immediately threw a rope over with a weight on it of some sort, tied it off, and went down the rope and got Captain Theron's hammer for him. Well, thereafter, he was his favorite son, of course, so he let us come down there pretty much as we wanted to, and swim off the boats and uh, mess around and so forth. And, uh, they, all the boats had a high mast and they had a gaff that came out off of them from, with some tackle that dropped down. And, and of course, they had uh, uh, more pulleys down at the bottom. They'd pick up their nets with overside and haul the Menhaden loaded nets and drop them into the hole with that. Well, we discovered that we could take those lines coming down from the, from the gaffs and we could get up on the pilot house of the inshore uh, Menhaden boat and swing out across the other one and drop into the road. That was that developed into a sport. And also, who could climb up the mast the highest and jump off? Now, we were pretty young in those days, and it was a little scary. And so we had a contest going continuously as we were moving up higher and higher over a period of time. And the guy that won it, cheated because he wore a pair of high top shoes and it hurt your feet as you got up higher, you know, to hit the water and we always hit it flat on. And he won the darn thing wearing those high top shoes. So, uh, anyhow, there's the characters and there's the docks. And uh, then up behind the docks uh, was a small country store, and I mean really small general store. It was about halfway up the bank that is behind the City Point docks to this day, which is, I guess, 60 feet high. And why they built the general store halfway up the bank, I don't know, because you had to walk up steps, a set of steps, and around one platform to get up there. And at the time that we came along, that store had been there for any number of years, and it was in pretty bad disrepair. And they were worried about it falling down into the street below. So they had put a three-quarter inch cable around it and taken it up and tied it around a big hickory stump on top of the bank there. 
And that was what was holding up the general store. But it was still very active. And uh, I remember uh, on Saturday nights occasionally, well, more, most every Saturday night, our sport would be to go down to Baden's store and go up there and, and buy a couple of Rum River Crook cigars, two for a nickel, and go down and sit on the dock and smoke cigars, you know, and, and big time it as it were in those days. And, um, and then we'd go swimming in the river. We'd take off our clothes and go swimming. Well, it was against the law to swim off the City Point dock. And we had a port warden, and now he was another great character. And he still has a lot of ancestors around, too. And as far as we could tell, his only job was to keep us from swimming off that dock. I mean, there might have been other things, but it was a political plum, and uh, that was a big family. So he was the one that, was, that got the plums in those days. And so he was always down there Saturday nights looking for us at one time or another. So we'd hide our clothes, and we'd go swimming and get up under the dock when he came around, that kind of stuff. But one night, he, he found our clothes, and he went off with them. So we were down there, about half a dozen of us, with no clothes. And we decided we had to <laughs> just kind of wing it. So we ran up the street, got up behind Ramsey Avenue there, and ducked into the first guy's yard that lived closest to the, to the dock. And uh, they outfitted us with shorts, all of us, so we could get home. Uh, well, that was the City Point docks. That was a great scene of activity. We spent a lot of time down there. And the rest of the time out rowing the boats up and down the river. And of course, that progressed. Can I take a break just a minute? Um, <clears throat> uh, one of the scenes off the City Point dock was you could sit down there on most any day during the Depression and Prohibition. And uh, and this was when I, I guess I was about 10 years old, which would be uh, 38 in that range through 40. And if you look down the river, you'd see several whiffs of smoke coming up through the trees, usually three of them. And they were fired up by three of the local bootleggers who were well known to the, to the hopeful uh, citizens. In fact, they were well-respected citizens. They were vital to the, the hopeful uh, social operations. And, uh, and well, one of them, I think, wound up getting caught and had to go to Atlanta prison for a year. But when he came back, he was to, I remember me visiting our home many times. And a uh, very genial fellow. But they uh, had their stills down here along the river. Uh, it, because I guess one of the great things was there were no roads back into the riverside in those days at these points. And uh, of course, anybody coming down the river, they had a good view of. So if it was the wrong boat and they knew all the boats along the river, then they simply disappeared, put out the fire and disappeared. So they all survived very nicely during the uh, prohibition days, as far as I know except for this one fellow, and I think he got caught moving whiskey up on the land somewhere, never down where he was making it. So that was, the, oh yeah, and, and another part of the scene was uh, they were still running the sailing, the old bug eyes up the river, bringing lumber from around the Chesapeake Bay. And occasionally, maybe once a month, one of them would come up the river. And that was pretty interesting in that the the captains of those boats, very seldom, very few of them, if I don't think any of them, had any formal education at all. They had all gone to work on the bay at, when they were kids and, and simply worked their way up. And therefore, they couldn't, uh, they didn't know how to read and write, and they couldn't pass the necessary exams to be a, certified as a captain of an inboard engine boat. They could sail the sailboats because they all, everyone knew they were better at that than anybody around. But as far as putting an engine in that boat and turning them loose, there were laws against it. And that was very silly, but that's the way it was. So they could sail a certain distance up the river, but unless the wind was very favorable, 
they would swing out a dory, and their dories had these Lathrop Marine engines in them. And those old Lathrop engines weren't fast, but they were very powerful. And they'd swing that dory off of the bowsprits of these bug eyes, tie off the stern so that they stayed straight, <clears throat> and they'd raise the bow a little bit so it would stay straight up, up on the bow of the boat, bow of the dory, and they'd tow those bug eyes up the river with them. And that's how they got to City Point where they unloaded. So they were part of the scene in those days, and uh, I'm sure I'm missing something, but. Why were they called bug eyes? Don't know, uh, but that was the name of the boats, and the Chesapeake Bay bug eyes are a very famous old boat, and there's some replicas now that have been built by people saying, Reedville, I think there's one. There's a couple of them around the river. And for a long time, they had bug eye races up out of Chesterton, Maryland. I remember them. Over the old boats that had been maintained. I'm not sure there are any of those left around, but I do remember that as uh, some of my earliest recollections, maybe when I was in my 20s, that they had those bug eye races up there. And they were the work boats of the Chesapeake Bay, aside from the from the smaller boats that uh, they used for their crabbing and, and their oystering. But the bug eyes were, hauled, the, uh, hauled the freight. I wish I, I've got a painting of one by Will Haddon that I told you about, who became a pretty famous Chesapeake Bay artist, hanging in my office that I look at every day. And it, it's a great painting, and it just brings back so many memories. And I remember as my, a kid, my ambition was to get a job and make enough money that I could buy an oyster buy boat and travel to the bay and, and buy oysters, you know, and make my living that way. But that was when I was really river and bay oriented, big time. And what happened to that thing? Well, it just faded along the way. I, I got through high school, I went to college, and uh, I never lost that great affinity to all, the, all those things. But I realized, of course, that there were some other opportunities out there. <laughs> so I set that aside as, as the, as the uh, recreation and went on with the opportunities. And that's about what it amounted to. One thing I've been wondering, when you started talking about the Wanza group, you said you were about eight. Yeah. Did you have any other kids that you were I can't, I can't remember it that well, to tell you the truth, uh, Judy. Uh, I know I went out on the river some uh, with my father occasionally and with others, my uncles. My uncles taught me how to swim, and this one taught me how to row. My mother was, a, was one of, of eight children, so I had five uncles. One of, my, one of my uncles made his pen money by catching copper, uh, Cottonmouth moccasins and milking them when he was young. Milking them? Milking them, yeah. He'd, he'd you know, hang the fangs over a jar or something and, and make them produce the venom, and he sold the venom. And he, he was a snake man, that was his thing. He just loved snakes. And he was fearless. And I'd walk around behind him building duck blinds, and we'd be going through marshes in the summertime. And we'd walk past an old cop, cotton mouth mox, and he paid no attention to him. I'm hugging this side of the of the trail, of course, trying to get there. But yeah, that was that was his thing. He loved snakes. I remember going over to my grandmother's house, and he'd have snakes, five different varieties, and shoe boxes up in his room. And I went walked in there one day, and my grandmother was yelling up the steps, "John, you come right down here and get this snake out of the living room, or I'm gonna have you clear all of them out of here." So that was one of my uncles. All of them were characters like that. But uh, so they took me out on the road early on, Judy, and I'm sure. But I don't really start. My, my recollection start with rowing that boat the first time, and then um, of course some of the Ramsey boys. I had moved from Ramsey actually around to Appomattox Street. I actually was living on the Appomattox River uh, when I was eight years old because my father built a home over there. But I was maybe 500 yards from uh, the confluence of the James and the Appomattox at City Point. 
I mean, I'd roll my little rowboat around every day and catch up with the guys, you know, on the other side. So that's, that's what I did. But uh, uh, they, for the most part, were older, and they had been on the river a couple of years ahead of me. And uh, eventually, one of them got a, an outboard engine. Uh, his mother, mother and father got him one, and that was, of course, a big, big advancement. And then I think after I was about 12, my father, who was in various businesses, but was in the hardware business, and uh, he traded a bad debt for a Bendix outboard, three horsepower, air cool, uh, which the Bendix Aircraft Corporation was trying to use to get into the outboard motor business, which was in its infancy in those days, of course. And that thing was a piece of junk. We now really couldn't make it run very long. I remember one of our trips down to Burl's Bay, we had it on the back of that, that uh, Cape Cod Dory, and it ran us down as far as Claremont. And we spent the night there, and we got up the next morning, and we started cranking on that thing, and we cranked all morning long. We'd been doing this so many times, finally I got disgusted with it. So I took it off and threw it in the river, and that was the end of that. We rode on down to Burl's Bay from there. So uh, anyhow, that, that was when things started picking up a little bit, and a couple more boats got on the river. We had a Sea Scout uh, master that uh, we joined later on when we were about 14 or so. And he had a, um, one of these molded plywood boats with a 22 horse Johnson on the back. And uh, that thing weighed, I guess, 250 pounds. Those early outboards were very, very heavy. In fact, this three horse that uh, my friends had uh, were one of the early ones and actually had a, had a rudder that you guided it. The motor was clamped down tight and you guided the boat with a rudder, just like you would a sailboat. But this one was more modern, and he had uh, a, uh, a, a guiding, whatever you call them, stick coming out off of the engine. And he did fine with it, and zoomed around the river and put on a big show, but made the mistake of getting out into the bay one day, and the wind came up, and he got out there, and and went mount, wound up turning the boat over, and it sank immediately with that big engine on the back, and somebody pulled him out and got him back home, but that was the end of his boat. I was, I was struck when you said there were only two engine boats in the river at one point. When did that start to shift? When did all these engines come in? Well, it started the first time, the first one I knew was with this three horse that my friend got. That had to be, let's see, 30. 10 years, 38, that'd be about 1939 or so. Mm -hmm. When that came in, when I got one, when Fred Faison got his 22, and uh, then they proliferated to an extent. But in no time before I went off to college, got out of high school in 45, do I remember more than, at the most, a couple dozen boats with engines. Uh, there might have been, but that's my recollection. Is it your sense that, that children growing up along the river can still have this idyllic Tonsoy life that you had growing up? Well, my children, uh, of course, I live on a farm across the river there at Coggins Point, and my, mine all had that opportunity, and it was a same great experience for them. Of course, they had many other uh, diversions, too, by that time. So they didn't spend quite as much time on the river as I did, but they had their share of it, and it was, meant a whole lot to them. I remember <laughs> my youngest son, Charlie, was pulling somebody. I had no 25-horse Johnson, I think, that I let them use with a 16-foot aluminum boat, and they were towing somebody on water skis, and he hadn't tightened it down good, and the darn engine went overboard out in the channel. And he very ruefully brought that in one day and explained himself about that. But they had a lot of fun. They did all those things. And uh, I think it meant a lot to them and was just uh, a great grounding. The river has an aspect about it, as does all waters. Of There's a soul to it. And that soul is 
is, is transferred like, to the people that are, have been involved with it <clears throat> over a period of years. It's just there. You don't recognize it when you're a kid. Uh, and I guess I really only come to recognize it in the last 10 or 15 years, what, what the great attraction has been. But it does. And it was a great grounding for, the, for all the children who then and now take advantage of it. Of course, so few of them now are taking advantage of it. And when you describe, <coughs> excuse me, the soul of the grandchildren. How would I? I don't know. It's just there. You, you, um, you feel it by osmosis. <laughs> and, um, well, it's so timeless in itself. And as you begin later on to start uh, relating to the fact that time is infinite for us humans, uh, and you realize how long that river has been traveling and providing for people, uh, both entertainment and livelihoods and means of transportation and all of the things that went with it. Uh, and it has its own history that is just uh, so extensive and so vital and gets transferred to you if you spend the time on it uh, just by being there, by hearing people talk about it. So you become a part of it, and that's how you become a part of the soul of it. Spending time on the river, with the river. Yeah, yeah. So anyhow, I wish more of the young people were to take advantage. It's amazing how so many live in the city of Oakville right now that have never been out on it. I know that Full Law, the, uh, uh, the uh, Appomattox group that is developing the trail and so forth along the river up there, um, Friends of the Lower Appomattox River, I guess it is, um, they have a program, have at least last several years, of bringing in these very large canoes that will handle about a dozen kids, and I don't know where they get them from, but they bring them in every spring, and they take all the children that want to show up out, paddle them up uh, down the river somewhere and bring them back, and they have the greatest time. But that's the only exposure they ever have, and it just uh, boggles my mind that that's all they're getting out of it, you know? Mm -hmm. But it's there for them, and if somehow we can enthuse them, but of course more and more they're being distracted by all of the uh, the iPhones, iPods, and the various things that come along. I know that I told my oldest grandchildren recently, hey, we, uh, my, their father and I were sitting there chatting, and they, they weren't being rude or anything. They were just overdoing their thing and punching in and doing their text work and talking and all that stuff. And I found out, I stopped and I said to them, I said, fellas, you have in your hand probably the greatest invention that man has made thus far, and it's the ultimate possibilities for you and for everyone, but that ain't where life is. Life is out here, and you need to take advantage of it and experience it. And fortunately, their father, who did experience it, sees to it that they do. Uh, they both fish, they hunt, they do all that good stuff, and it's, it makes so much difference. And, your outlook on life, your appreciation of life, and the whole thing. It's just, it's a dimension that it saddens me to see as being lost by so many young people. If you pretended that I'm 10 years old and I've always lived in Richmond and you I have the time, what would you say to me to get me to come down and experience the river? What would I say to you at that time, when I was 10? No, I'm or to you right now? Well, of course, the James River um, Association is doing a great job with that, with that installation up at Presque Isle Island. And we happened to build that for them, which we were very happy to do and enjoyed it a lot. Um, getting back on the water and just transporting the crew every day. It was fun for everybody. It was a great experience for the crew, a lot of whom had never been out on the river before. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyhow, they have that, and they're promoting it in Richmond. They're bringing a lot of inner city kids out there, and it's a great experience for them. And they have canoes down on the row, and they take them out. But what, what I would say to a 10-year-old is 
that there are outlets for you. You can experience the James River. Uh, they're available at these different points on the James. The uh, installation of the Association on Breast Isle is there, available for you. You might have to wait your turn, but it's there, and they do a great job of orienting them in all these things we're talking about. Why well, say they do it? Because it it probably is important a part of rounding out the education as anything that's available to them. And uh, failure to take advantage of it means missing that important part that I can't describe to you well enough until you do it. But I can assure you that if you do, you'll never regret it, and it will stick with you. So. That, that's what I tell them in so many words. I think the tears would go big. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and of course, I would make myself available to them. I've got, I own 10 boats of various types, from canoes to pond boats to 24 foot inboard outboards to go offshore fishing in, all of which are not quite as old as I am, but they're getting up there. So they're not valuable, and, but they're there and they're still usable. I keep them up. I've got a rowboat. That is my pride and joy that I had built and I helped build about seven, eight years ago. And I, I, I got some plans that I liked. I modified them. And what I, my aim was, I wanted my grandchildren to learn how to row because everything is motorized these days, of course. And so I engaged this fellow who had retired and worked for us for years, was a woodworker, and I helped him build a mold for it using this plan that I would bought and modified. And we built this 14-foot rowboat. It's made out of solid mahogany. It's a beautiful little boat. And I row it a couple times a week still on the good times, good days, uh, spring and summer, and sometimes in the winter when have the opportunity. And I try to row across to the James River Association picnic every year just to add a little local color to it. But uh, so I have that and I've got some other boats I could take them. I'd be glad to take anybody out that wanted to, you know, just take a look and experience it. See to it that they got taken out on the river, let's put it that way. So, you know, it's it's available if you look hard enough, but unfortunately they're so um, so entertained by so many things that uh, that really, is, I guess, it's difficult to get them to look that far or really want to be interested in it. Well, it's, I think that's a wonderful place to wrap up. That you had built this beautiful handmade boat that you still row is is just a powerful way of bringing. Your childhood experiences and selling it to the next mm -hmm. That's just that's a beautiful thing to do. Well, thank you. Well, I have to admit that they haven't taken to the rowing too much. They go out on it, and uh, I've had them <laughs> talk to two older boys to row after a fashion, and, and the oldest one actually rowed double with me over here to the um, picnic last year, which I was very proud of. Uh, still imperfected and catching a lot of crabs. We used to call this stroke where you were splashing water and not getting a good grip catching a crab. But we got over and got back, turned out real well. I do need to tell you a couple more things about the environment of the river, if we're getting ready to wrap this up. Okay. Can I do that? God, I don't know how long I've rambled on, but um, the river, during this early period I'm describing, was to us pristine. Maybe at some point it was more so. But uh, there were few houses along the river, just the plantations and a few homes here and there. And all the rest was just woods and water. The river itself was all of the flats uh, were filled with eelgrass. The only clear area was the channel itself. Oh. Eelgrass was so thick that it, at half tide from then on down, you could barely roll a boat through it. 
And of course, it was a tremendous habitat for wildfowl, fish, or catfish would, it grew in clumps, sort of. And at low tide, a catfish would burrow up under those clumps. And one of the things we did to entertain ourselves, we never ate catfish, but we'd reach up on there and pull them out by the tails and throw them in a bucket until we got a bucket full, and then we'd dump them, that's all. But the river was, as far as we could tell, was pristine. We just accepted it as such. Never knew it to be otherwise, you know. And of course, I've watched it become polluted, and we lost the eelgrass and all that sort of thing. And so it's now in its present state, but it seems to be stabilized. And uh, they are controlling the wastes, and it could come back. So I hope you have a couple of questions along those lines. But I'll stop at that point. Well, you described one huge change, the entire river. I don't remember the entire river. I, my, my recollection is just, well, of course, it didn't extend down into to, uh, salt water except on the banks. But there was extensive growth of eelgrass along the banks of the river and the, and the Chesapeake Bay, of course. Um, and they were a, a habitat for fish and a breeding grounds and all that stuff. But I do recollect that at least as far as as far as this point, I know we had solid eelgrass and probably for another five, six miles down. And then it thinned out some as you got down to Claremont, the river got wider, got deeper in the middle. And so it wasn't as well defined because the channel was out in the middle, but there was deep water coming into the shore. Well, uh, I would continue the programs they have going on and, of course, try to amplify them as much as possible. Well, one of the things, two things, two big things. Number one, I would do away with the hydrilla they planted, which is insidious as it can be. And I don't know whether you're familiar with that or not. Shall I take a minute to describe what's happening with hydrilla? Sure. Vems came to me uh, some years back. I won't name names there, and said, we want to start a planting program on some of the creeks off the James, and we'd like to take Powell's Creek as a starter. And our farm, coming off of a couple of lakes we have, has two guts, I call them, two streams coming down to Powell's Creek that were very easy to shut off and fence off, which I did for them to keep the catfish and carp from coming in and destroying what they planted. They came in and planted uh, a mixture of various bottom grasses, uh, stuff like foxweed and some eelgrass was in there, I think, and several other things. But what I didn't know was they were putting hydrilla in there also. If I had known, I certainly wouldn't have cooperated with it because hydrilla, of course, you may be familiar with it, but it's, it's just pervasive. It kills off everything else. It grew up, the other grasses were coming along nicely for about two years, but it eventually took over and has matted those little creeks now. So that in the summertime, you couldn't run a boat up through there. And hydrilla transplants itself by branches breaking off and it floating down with the currents and going to other places. So now it has moved down, it's in Heron Creek, it's in the upper reaches of the Powell's Creek that gets, again, gets so thick with it that you can't travel it in the summer. And I am very concerned that it's not going to stop, it's going to continue to choke the waters, at least off the James and maybe even along because some of the rivers in Florida, of course, as you're probably aware, uh, have been choked by it, and they actually have to run these cutter machines through it to keep the channels open. University of Maryland did a study on it, and they have pointed out just how damaging it is, how insidious it is, and how important it is to get it early on. So well, the number one project I would have, and I've personally contacted them people, but nothing has happened. I've been intending to see my representative in the state legislature about it, and I'm going to. In fact, I told him last week I wanted to go talk to him next week, and, uh, and that's the number one thing I want to talk about, would be 
to stop this, I don't think there's been any more planning of it, but to somehow get a program going and get rid of what's there, and that's very difficult to do, but it's probably still doable. So that would be my number one thing about the ecology of the river would be to, to, um, to stop the growth of hydrilla right where it is. Uh, number two thing would be to learn how to plant eelgrass and have it grow. Now, as you know, there have been some plantings around, and you're probably aware of the fact that, maybe you're not, that uh, they have fenced off some areas and planted eelgrass. And the eelgrass has come up, but the fencing has been too light, too flimsy, and what they didn't take into account was that during these freshets and the storms up in the mountains when we have high volume of water coming down, it sweeps a lot of logs and things, and they get swept up against these um, fenced off areas, and they start tearing them up, and it's not long before they're wide open and the catfish can get to them and the carp can get to them, and they tear, tear all the eelgrass out. But I do think it's possible <clears throat> with the proper type of structures that they could get the eelgrass going again. They prove that they can make it germinate. Mm -hmm. Now it's just a matter of protecting it long enough that it can protect itself, and that means having a big enough area of it to allow it to uh, provide for the damage that's going to be done to it and still keep going. So they'd be my two number one things. Well, I have to give my final salute to the old Ramsey gang. Thank you. Thank you, Get it back together here. So that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> Okay, I remember sometime uh, right after college, I think that, yes, uh, after I'd gone to work, probably about 25, 26 years old, I bumped into Mac Jamison, the elder, um, and we were talking about things in the river and his experiences on it and how he came down and, and what I was doing at the time. And uh, he was telling me his story about how he came to Berkeley and it seems that uh, his father was a, uh, a noted engineer in New York City, and I think it had uh, something to do with designing the Brooklyn Bridge, amongst other um, bridges and edifices and so forth. And he had 10 children. Uh, Mac was the youngest of the group. And Mac uh, uh, came to the last inheritance. And his father said, Mac, uh, I, uh, I've pretty much given away what finances and other assets I have. The only thing I got left is an old farm down in, uh, in Virginia, and I'm going to give that to you. Uh, it's called Berkeley, and he, I'm not sure he'd ever been down here. I don't think he had, but he'd bought it. And he says, you go down there and see what you can do with it. So Mac tells a story that he arrived in Hopewell, and he engaged a fellow to row him down the river to Berkeley in a rowboat. He had his uh, sole uh, belongings with him and some supplies, and um, got down to Berkeley and landed, took a look up at it, and it was all grown up, trees, weeds, everywhere. The house itself was falling down to an extent, meaning that the roof had caved in in a couple of places and it was leaking and had destroyed a lot of, of, of the insides. And he found a room that uh, was dry and took up in it and apparently was in a corner that he could see hopeful at night. And I remember him telling me how lonely he was for a while and he would look up at the lights of hopeful and uh, would just wish that he had some exposure to people and to lights and to activity. But of course, as we all well know, he did a beautiful job and devoted his life and worked very hard at resurrecting 
Berkeley Plantation, the, the house and the grounds and the farm and the whole works, and was the, uh, the, the man who, who developed the, uh, the visitation of all the old plantations by uh, the various visitors that came along and became a major source of income for all of them. Did a beautiful job, was always a great spokesman for, spokesman for Charles City County and the plantations. But I didn't want to pass that along because uh, he deserves a great deal of credit for what's happened on this side of the river. So he started the tourism? He started, started as far as I know. I think that was the beginning. And I think Berkeley was the first of the plantations open to the public. <laughs> 